Two of our most basic instincts is understanding the difference between right and wrong. And um, the more, when I started to think about today's, today's talk, I realized, you know what? My dogs, I have a couple of dogs. My dogs know the difference between right and wrong. You know, so, so I kind of take right and wrong to a different level. So today's discussion is about risk. It's about financial risk, it's about investing, and it's about, it's about over the last two or three decades, we've tried to put investing and finance into a box that is defined by right and wrong. And what I really want to do today is kind of break it out of that box and make it what it really should be, which is about understanding and thinking about probabilistic, predictable outcomes, about quantitative strategies, about really understanding what it's like to take risk, understand risk, and appreciate risk, because I think we've gotten away, this generation, or the last couple of decades actually, we've marginalized risk, we've become too safe. We are very risk averse right now. We have become the era of passive investors. We put away money, we hope it sits there for the next 50 years, and it works for us. We don't like to take a lot of risk, whether it's in listed marketplaces, whether it's in just personal investments or anything else. We have, we have a new term, it's called financial literacy. And it's horrible, it's destroying the world of risk because we're starting to believe that financial literacy is as basic as it's made out to be, and everybody can talk about the basics of it, but that's not what it is at all. Fi true financial literacy is about taking risk. So I'm gonna try to change some of those perceptions today. I, I don't have a solution to fix everything, but I'm hoping that um, my stories will inspire. I'm Tom Sosnoff, and let's, let's go. So, for starters, you know, I never learned to type. And the worst thing, even worse than not learning to invest until you're 50, is not learning to type until you're 50. Because um, my, my grandmother was a legal secretary, and she could type like, you know, a billion words a minute. And when I was a kid growing up in the 70s, and all the other kids took typing, I figured out, well, I don't need typing because my grandmother can type. And that was my first, like, and I'm not kidding, you know, she typed anything, like, 10 times faster than anybody else. So all my papers were perfect. She was like an automatic spell check 30 years before the spell check. And the, and the coolest thing is, I didn't know now in my 50s that I'd be writing 250 emails a day. And I really miss learning how to type. So my first shot at really taking risk, I took the passive route. And that kind of haunted me, but you know what? I never forgot that. Never forgot it. So my next step is to start to learn how to take risk. So I have a, um, a fun little story. I was about maybe 16, 15, 16, 17, and I decided I need to learn how to make money, and I also wanted to learn how to play golf, and I could kill two birds with one stone if I was a caddy. Anybody, any of you ever caddy before? It's not exactly the most glamorous thing, but it worked for me. So I start caddying when I'm a young kid, making $20, maybe 15 to $20 a day, and through the process of caddying, I become friends with this caddy master who was 40 years older than me, 50 years old, I don't know how old he was. And his name was Jimmy Rocco. And Jimmy Rocco and I became friends, and I think he was a caddy master until he was 90. Anyway, we had a caddy shack. And inside the caddy shack, there was a bucket. And 15 paces from the bucket, there was a piece of carpet. And all the caddies, 50, 60, 100 of them, because the place was always busy, would take 15 paces back, go to the piece of carpet, um, take a chip with a sand wedge and try to put it into the bucket, and if you made it on a fly, you got to keep all the money in the bucket. But every time you took a shot, you had to put a quarter in the bucket. So I'm like, oh wow, this is my first you know, kind of gambling venture, this is kind of cool. So every day, myself and all the other caddies would go up there and we'd take our shots, throw our quarters in the bucket, take our shots, and we'd miss and occasionally we'd make, but we never made any money. We lost, over the summer, probably hundreds of dollars shooting into that bucket. Jimmy Rocco, on the other hand, made thousands of dollars because he understood pot odds way before we understood pot odds. He would, first of all, he was a better golfer, but second of all, he would never shoot into the bucket until it made sense for him to put money into the bucket because the payout was much greater than the amount of money he was putting in. So he was way ahead of us as far as pot odds. So over time, him and I become friends. And 
every single night, well, let's just say I wasn't left in his will. It wasn't like that kind of friendship. Him and I, every night, would go out and play golf. And in the process of playing golf, he'd take every dime that I made. That was how our friendship worked. <laughs> Over seven years. But the beautiful thing about it, in the end, was that he taught me a lot about taking risk, odds, pot odds, quantifying risk, what were my chances of a probabilistic outcome, and learning this crazy sport, which I really didn't need to learn anyway. What's, what's cool about it, in the end, is that I finally started to beat him. And at the very end of our, kind of our relationship, because I had to move on and go to college and actually have a life, the, I played him four nights in a row and beat him four nights in a row. I think I probably took $100 off him. He beat me for a few thousand dollars. I took $100 off him. He was crying like a baby. He sits me down one night. We're going to play. He goes, this is the last night we're going to play. Bring all your money. Almost like he had been setting me up, but I'm okay with that. He sits me down, and um, just like a real father figure, and just like a, you know, he starts to articulate risk and gambling to me. Now, he was, he was a very smart guy. And he puts his hand on his shoulder, and he goes, Jew boy, tonight I kill you. Yeah. That was the articulation of how he was going to take care of me that night and learn all about um, uh, gambling. He went out and shot a 30, he shot a 31 on a par 36. I gave him four and a half strokes that night. I lost every dime I had. Never forgot it because the lessons learned with that gambling experience over a multi-year period changed the way I thought about risk forever. So God loves those who take risk, which is probably not true, but uh, <laughs> God loves all of you. Um, God just likes the ones who take risk a little bit more. What's interesting about this is that we've become, I talked about marginalizing risk and marginalizing finance, but we've become this society where we think that, that especially our youngest generation thinks that there's um, maybe a greater moral purpose, and that moral purpose can come without a challenge or without risk. I don't agree. I believe that in order to create, whether you want to say moral purpose, opportunity, there needs to be a ridiculous challenge. That challenge has to include risk, and that challenge has to include unlimited opportunity. And we don't view everything like that anymore. In fact, we're actually a little scared of it. At this point in time, with incubators all over the place, with graduate programs focusing on entrepreneurship, with startups abound all over, we are at our lowest level of entrepreneurship in 30 years. I know that seems crazy because all you hear is startup this, entrepreneur this, all this stuff, but we are at our lowest level in 30 years. That's crazy. So I finished the story. I load up my Celica in 1980, 1981, and decide I'm going to come to Chicago and I'm going to go to the last bastion of free market capitalism, which is the trading floors. And I end up in, in uh, Chicago Board Options Exchange, and I end up as a trader. And I'm actually, it turns out I'm a pretty good trader, surprisingly, because there's thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people that try. There's a few of us that turned out to be pretty good. In the process of doing all that, obviously, you take lots of risk, but the markets are wide. The opportunity was ginormous, and so we take advantage of it. Fast forward a little bit. I start to make money. I'm a young kid. I never saw my parents invest ever. So I never knew how to invest because I come from a generation where our parents never invested. So I need to learn how to invest, but I don't know how. So I start asking people, and I get you know, somebody's brother-in-law who's an accountant who sells me the last unit of an oil and gas tax shelter. I get, somebody's, um, I get somebody who's doing a limited partnership with a restaurant. I started to invest, and over the next 20 years, amazingly, I went 0 for 19. Now, you guys all understand the law of large numbers, and with any kind of reasonable probability of success, it's impossible to go 0 for 19. So either I was the worst investor ever, but, or I just chose dumb things, like I invested in a professional wrestler in WWF. I invested in restaurants that had dumb concepts, real estate, which made no sense at all. But over the years, 19 years, because we made a lot of money as a kid, as, you know, during this period, we made all these horrible investments. And I kept thinking to myself, oh, I, there has to be something different. I didn't know what it was, but there has to be something different. But I figured out, after 20 years of investing, and let's just say it was $50,000 a year, I invested a million dollars, I lost every penny of it, and then if I invested passively, like I just ripped on a couple seconds ago, that million dollars would have been 
$4 million because it was an era where the stock market exploded. Even though there was no past investments back then, the stock market was up huge, the S&Ps were up huge. I would have made millions and millions and millions of dollars. And the nice thing is, I left it all on the table. I didn't care at all. All of it on the table because the lessons learned going back to the days of caddying, the lessons learned going back to the days of all these horrible investments, I had to take something away from it. What we ended up taking away from it was in my 40s, we started out and we said, you know what, we're going to take everything we have and we're going to use all these experiences over the last X number of years and through these experiences, we are going to generate opportunity for ourselves. So we went out and we built a company called Thinkorswim. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but it was a company that was in the derivative space, online brokerage, it was cool technology. We built it 15 years ago. Even today, it's the best technology in the world, but we sold it, we were a public company, we got bought out. We created a billion dollars in market cap. So the way I look at this was, okay, so I lost a few million dollars, it happens, and I never thought about it then, I didn't think about it later, but we took all those experiences and all that risk and rolled it into an amazing opportunity in our 40s. But we didn't stop there. When we got, oops, when we got into our 50s, we did it all again. And right now we've built a financial media company, which is the fastest growing media company in the world called Tasty Trade, and building software again. And what we're doing is we're spreading the idea of financial content, alternative financial content, that people can actually apply. It's like functional, it's applicable, it's quantitative, it's logic driven. And we started this in our 50s. It's trying to be, you know, I want people regardless of age or regardless of where you are in that kind of moral purpose, um, yield, um, in the moral purpose curve, that probability curve, just to understand that there's opportunity through experience and there's opportunity mostly through taking risk and regardless of where that risk is in the curve, it's generally extremely valuable. So now we've gone on kind of a career from, from starting with you know, caddying all the way up to, um, all the way up to two different businesses, um, a thousand some odd jobs, a billion dollars in market cap, but now I've got to do something else. Now I've got kids, and now I've got to pass on to my kids kind of the idea that we can, you need to take risk. We've got to pass on, hey, you know what? Risk-taking was important to me, but your generation doesn't know how to take risk. Your generation is very comfortable being safe. And so what I've tried to do over the last couple of years is pass this message down to my kids through lots of different um, discussions. One of the discussions and one of the opportunities I had was with my daughter, who also, by the way, had a TED Talk once. Um, my daughter, when she was going to college, her car got totaled. And when her car got totaled, the... Um, I went to visit her to get, help her get a new car with the insurance money and everything else, and I sat down and I had this experience which I thought, hey, you know what? This will create an opportunity for you to see what your probabilistic outcome will be, meaning that if this person, if this salesman wants to sell a car really bad, then he'll hit your bid. If the salesman doesn't need to sell this car really, bid, then, really bad, then he'll walk away. And luckily for me, I played the pot odds, and the salesman really needed to sell the car. So the story goes kind of, um, my daughter and I are sitting there, and this young salesman comes in, and he tries to, um, he looks at us both, and, and he realizes, you know, like, like I kind of pass for homeless most of the time. So, <laughs> in fact, I'll tell you just a quick little story. I'm on, a, I'm on a Southwest Airlines flight one day, and there's this little kid sitting next to me, and she's screaming. And I feel bad, because I don't know what she's screaming about, but she's screaming, she, and you know how kids sometimes talk kind of in a little bit of a loud voice, and they, and, and her mom's saying to her, hey, what's wrong, you're a great flyer, you shouldn't be, you know, this is nothing for you, we haven't even taken off yet. And she goes, mom, I'm not scared of flying, I'm scared to the big guy ne sitting next to me. That was me. <laughs> so, so I, so now I'm sitting in this car dealership, and this car dealers looking at me, and I know he's got lots of cars, so I know the pot odds are grossly in our favor, but my daughter's nervous because she's never bought a car before and she doesn't want this particular car to walk off the lot. So we go through the whole process of negotiating and finally at the very end, we can't come to an agreement. So I take a check out of my pocket and on the check, I, um, I write out amount, just any amount, and some number that I came up with. I didn't have any idea if it was real or not. Couple, th maybe $1,000 less than he was asking. And I hand the check to the car dealer, car salesman. 
and he looks at it and he goes, we're never going to sell the car for this price. I go, fine, then call me back in an hour because we'll be looking at other dealers and just rip up the check. So he goes into the back room and he comes back and he goes, congratulations, you own the car. And my daughter the whole time was giving me that same whisper, you know, that loud whisper where they tell, dad, just do it, you're ruining my life, blah, 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 the whole thing. Like, oh, every kid does. You know, don't, please don't embarrass me. This guy probably knows my friend, everything, you know. I mean, I was one of those parents where they dropped you off, like, you know, a block away from the school, one of those parents. Okay, so, <laughs> so through the whole process then, we end up, um, and the guy comes back out and says, the car is yours. He goes back in, he does all the paperwork. And about 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, he comes out onto the, um, into the showroom, and he looks at me, and he goes, he goes, you know, and he's got, like, fire in his eyes right now. And he looks at me and he says, I can't believe you squeezed me for $500 because I just Googled you. <laughs> just having some fun with it. <laughs> it's really important that you guys, um, uh, the takeaway from this, and I hope the takeaway from this, is that it's really good, it's really helpful to learn how to take risk before you're 50, and before you're 60, and before you're 80, whatever it is, because one of the most powerful things we can do in building a legacy, and it, building legacy, building wealth, wealth might not even be important, but just building a legacy is understanding, understanding quantitative risk and how that risk relates to either what you want to do or to your legacy or anything else, and very few people understand that, again, because we've been, we've been taught now, oh, so we, we've been taught about so much about passive investing and so much about being risk averse that it's scary in that sense. So thank you very much.